And who, who knows me, actually? So this is, gets to be a problem when a, when a significant people, number of people in the class. But the people, the rest of you, actually have no idea who I am, right? Just some guy who walked in in a pair of jeans and cufflinks, and here he is, right? So why are you actually listening to me? Why? Why listen? What's the real reason? I mean, not, not the nice reason. What's the real reason you're listening? I mean, yeah. So previous experience with uh, CTM tells us that you're going to say something very, very yeah, previous, exactly, previous experience associated with the CDTM and maybe the LMU and the TU and other good names like that gives you all the ability, gives you the ability to believe that what I'm going to say is worth saying. So what I'm talking about today is entrepreneurial thinking. Okay, so the question is that I pose is, does an entrepreneur think actually differently than a normal person? Yeah, or than, a, than an employee, for that matter? And my answer would be yes, entrepreneurs do think differently. And I also say that you can, you can learn how to think like an entrepreneur. But the purpose of this particular next hour and a half that we have together is not to learn how to think entrepreneurially. The purpose is really to start right now, to really start thinking entrepreneurially immediately. So in order to do that, you have to, I actually don't mean you as a group, I mean you and you and you and you, each one of you individually. You need to look at the way you think, sort of the way I would look at this pen. So I'm, I'm inviting you to look at your own thinking. Okay, so let's, let, let me help you along and ask a question. So who, just so we see how you actually think. Okay, so how many of you think that in order to start a company, you need a good idea? Who thinks you need a good idea to start a company? Okay, keep your hands up for a minute. Keep your hands up. All right, who thinks, who, do, who doesn't have the need? Who thinks you need a good idea? Okay, who thinks you need money? If you've had your hand up once, keep it up. Don't put your hand down. If any of the tr following are true, keep your hand up. Who thinks you need money? Yeah, okay. And who thinks of those who still don't have their hands up, who thinks that you need the right people? Okay, so there we have it. We actually have 100% of the class. Okay, so there's... Anybody know how many people are sitting here? So roughly 27 people sitting in the room, and 100% of you, we know now, and that's what I'm trying to point out. Look at that. That's what you think. I asked the question, do you need either a good idea, money, or the right people to start a business? And every single one of you raised your hand. So now we've clarified that that's how you think. That's what you think. I didn't say that. That's what you think. And I would tell you that you're all wrong. And I'm pretty sure I'm about that because I started a company with a really bad idea, with no money, and with definitely the wrong people, one of whom was probably me. <laughs> <laughs> so, but my point is, my point is, you see, if you think you need something that you do not have, then the great probability is that that thinking is going to stop you from doing what it is that you want to do. You see, because you have this thought in your head that says, I need more money. I can't start this company yet. I don't have the right people yet. I don't even have a good idea. I can't start a good company. And that thinking might be one of the things that really stops you from getting whatever it is or creating whatever it is that you want to create in your life. So another question, where does a company start in your body? What body part? Where does, your, where does a company start? Any guesses? In your, in your heart? I see somebody saying in your heart. That's a very nice answer. I like it. It's not the one I'm looking for. In your hands. You have to do it, get out there and, and go. Okay. Any other answers? It's not the one. You had one. You wanted to say hands too? 
in your stomach, like you have a gut feeling about it, like so I'm yeah? Okay, that's a good one, yeah? Listening to other people. I mean, all of these things are true. It's good to do that. It's good to listen to other people. Yeah, where else? Yeah, I was, uh, you were you thinking... Eyes because it's your problem and it is often said, it is often said that entrepreneurship is seeing what everybody else sees, but thinking what nobody else has thought. See, like if I said to you, if I had walked in 20 years ago and I said, I have an unbelievable, incredible company. I want you to finance it. And what we're going to do is we're going to sell coffee. Yeah, everyone would have been like, okay, coffee, that's a great idea. But that's more or less what Starbucks did 20 or whatever years ago when they started. They looked and there was the coffee market. People have been drinking coffee for God knows how long. But now it's a multi-billion dollar company. So your eyes help, but where else does a company start? Any last guesses? Still a bunch of body parts. Nobody wants to... Take a shot at it? Okay, so I say that a company starts in your mouth. A company starts in your mouth because a company starts with a declaration. And a declaration, by definition, is something which is true in the split second that you say it. It's not something that might be true in the future. That's an assertion. So an assertion is we, we have to wait to see if that's true. So if I say I assert that my software company, Avonquest, is going to do 100 million this year, we have to wait until the end of the business year. We have to see whether or not we really do 100 million or not. So here, I'm making another assertion just so we're clear because that's not a declaration. I, I assert that if you and you, meaning individually again, if you really, really bring yourself to this lecture right now, that this lecture has the power, has the ability to change your life. In the next hour. Now, I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, it's amazing what an American will say when you put them up in front of a room, right? <laughs> Incredible. Those Americans, they just say anything there are. What a load up. <laughs> Unbelievable. How do they get away with it, right? I never say something like that. Yeah, but I have, I have some proof to show that that's true. I mean, I have, I have students who have sat in my classes and have come afterwards, actually CDTM students who have come and come to me and said, can you help me get an internship? And some of them have ended up in California, and some have ended up in Paris, and some have ended up in London and other good places where I happen to be involved in companies. And there are people who have sat in this lecture and decided afterwards they actually wanted to come and, and work with me. And there's people who are employed now because of that. So it is possible, it is possible that this lecture in this next hour and whatever minutes we have really can change your life. But that's all an assertion. We don't know. A declaration is very different. A declaration is true in the split second that you say it. So let me give you a good example and a bad example of a declaration. And in the companies where I'm involved, I always say, if you have good news, tell me next week. Because if it's still good news next week, it's probably really good news. If you have bad news, I want to know immediately. Because it's very difficult, not impossible, but very difficult to solve problems that you do not know about. And therefore, as Bill Gates said in one of his books, bad news must travel fast. Now, so here's a bad news declaration. When a president of a country or a uh, prime minister or a dictator, for that matter, somebody who has the power in a country, you must have the power to make a declaration you see, I could say now, I declare all of you are medical doctors. Congratulations, I declare you all medical doctors. Completely irrelevant declaration. It is not a real declaration because I do not have the power to declare you a medical doctor. But when a president, prime minister, dictator, someone with power says the words, I declare war on another country, then the state of war is brought, in, brought into being just like that, by the Declaration. So in the United States, we have the Declaration of Independence. And 
on July 4th, 1776, they declared, we are free, we declare we are free, and therewith they were free. It doesn't mean that, that the Brits didn't come and attack immediately, but a company is like that. I mean, as soon as you declare that you start a company, people are going to come and attack you immediately, and they're going to say, what a stupid-ass idea that is. Excuse me. Turn that off. Yeah, and competitors are going to come, and they're going to attack you. Yeah, and so, but really, you know, a company starts with your word. A company starts with your word. Now, here's a, here's a good example of a declaration, at least in my case. And that would be marriage. Yeah, on June 14th this year, I'll be married for 22 years. And so marriage continues to be a very good declaration for me. But basically, when you stand next to that man or woman that you're going to marry, at least, in fact, in the United States, they actually say the words. There's a, there's a priest or a minister or a rabbi or a justice of the peace. Someone who has the power in the country actually says the words, by the power vested in me, I now declare you man and wife. Now, who's married? Just as a show of hands. Anybody married in the class? So one, two, so it's just the three of us, right? And now, you both know, right? That's a declaration that really, really changes your life. Just like that. Because the split second before that person with the power makes that declaration, you are not married. And that's, in fact, why they even say, if any man or woman knows why these two people should not be wed, speak now or forever hold your peace. Because they know that a split second later, those two people are going to be married. Before they can even, you can even kiss the bride or the groom. You're married, just like that. And all of the good and all of the bad stuff that comes along with it comes pouring into your life. And what I'm saying is that what you need what you really need to start a company is your word. You need to make the commitment, you need to say the words, I declare that I am starting this company and therewith the company is started. And you may or may not have a good idea. Yeah? You may or may not have money. You may or may not have the right people. The question is, are you going to keep your word even if you fail? Yeah? Even if you fail. Are you going to keep your word even if you fail? Now, in Germany, people love to worry about failure. One of the national pastimes is actually worrying about failure. In fact, if you actually look on the, you know, you take the statistics and you ask the question from, you actually find that out of 18 countries in Europe, there's only one, and I won't name it at the moment, but there's only one where people worry more about failure than in Germany. Yeah, so you can say, hey, great, we're number two. <laughs> so I have some good news and some bad news for you about failure as well. See, because look, let's see how you think. Who likes to fail? Honestly. That's pretty honest, actually. Yeah, me, yeah. People, or maybe some of us are willing to fail, but who really likes it? Like, yeah, <laughs> great, <laughs> failure. Not too many of us really like that. Yeah? It's not a real popular thing, failure. So I do have some very good news about failure. And now you should be worried, right? Because you know that I always like to give you the bad news first. But this time I give you the good news first. And the good news about failure is, and I'm sure that I'm right about this, is that you do not have to worry about failure. Just really stop spending, seriously, your valuable time worrying about failure. Yeah? It takes real time to worry about failure. I am not saying don't make business plans. I am not saying try, don't, don't work to avoid mistakes. Yeah? I am not saying any of that. I am simply saying stop worrying about failure. Oh, no, I might fail. I better not do it. Stop that. Yeah, thank you very much, whoever's talking, but shut up. And so the bad news, unfortunately, about failure is that failure will find you. Failure will just walk into your life, sit down next to you, put its arm around you and say, Hi there, my name's Failure, what's yours? <laughs>
right? I mean, or has anybody here never failed? Yeah, of course, we've all failed. And where are you going to fail? Let's, go, let's look at it realistically. You're definitely going to fail in your studies. You'll definitely fail with your friends. You're certainly going to fail with your family. If you have kids, you'll definitely fail your kids. If you start a company, you're definitely going to fail. If you take a job, you'll certainly fail. And you will absolutely fail yourself. <laughs> Great. Yeah, so why worry about it? You see, the, the thinking, you know, worrying is very equivalent to thinking. Now, it takes time to think about the things, yeah? And to worry about them is a very negative kind of thinking. That's why I'm saying stop worrying about it, because the question is not really, am I willing to fail or do I want to fail? The question is, how am I going to be, how am I going to be when failure shows up? How am I going to be when failure shows up? Am I going to be, you know, there's the story of the oak tree, which in the big storm, the lightning bolt comes, it hits the oak tree, the oak tree cracks in half and it never gets up again. And then there's this big storm where the bamboo tree gets blown all the way down to the ground. And then when the storm goes by, the bamboo tree comes back up again. And I'm saying that entrepreneurship is a lot more like the bamboo than it is like the oak. And the people who are successful entrepreneurs are the ones who get back up again. See, so, and keep remembering that we're thinking here entrepreneurially. So let's, let's look again for a second at how, at, at how you all think, okay? So we, we already clarified that about half the class does know something about me. Yeah? We also know that you think that because the university has said I'm a good person to look to and I'm uh, listen to and I'm on the roster, in fact, that you ought to do that. But for a lot of you, that's the only reason that you're sitting here listening to me. So let's use me as an example, because I happen to be standing here. Let's look for a second in your own mind right now, what do you think about me right now? You're thinking something, yeah? Well. Interesting speech, what an arrogant guy, can't stand these Americans, I wish this would be over, this is great, I'm getting some, who is he, what's he talking about? You are thinking something right now. There is some conversation going on in your head about me, especially because now I'm asking you to think about what you think about me. Okay, so now what I'm going to do is I'm going to take, take three minutes, and in these three minutes, I'm going to tell you my life story, so we get that out of the way as well. And then, but the purpose is that I want to show you, I want you to look at the difference in what you think when, in just three minutes difference. We're only talking about three minutes, okay? And being an entrepreneur, you very, 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 very often must change people's minds. You have to change the way people think. Now, because if everybody thought the way you thought, then somebody probably would have done what you're doing anyway. So, we just uh, start this. So I'm American. I was born in Philadelphia. I went to the University of Pennsylvania. I was in the Wharton undergrad program. So I have a bachelor's degree in entrepreneurship and international business. It was the first year that Wharton offered entrepreneurship as a major. And I graduated in 1983, and much to my surprise, I couldn't find anyone to hire me to run their international business, even though I had this great bachelor's degree and I had studied. And so I decided to start my own international business together with my college roommate. And since I didn't have any ideas about what kind of business to start, he came up with the idea, which was, hey, there's this new thing called the IBM PC. There's going to be all this software in America. We don't have any software. So let's license the software from the Americans and let's take it over to Europe and let's go to Germany because it's the biggest market for translated software and all the Americans will go to England anyway by themselves. And that's what we did. And the first 12 years of that company were absolutely horrible and miserable. We lost about $850,000 of family, friends and fools money. And then after 12 years, we figured it out. We turned the company around. And in about two and a half years, we paid back the entire $850,000 and paid back uh, for the next two years all the investors two to one. So after 14 years, everyone got their money back and we closed the first company. 
And then, with 14 years' experience, I started another software company by myself, and it was 1997. There was this new thing called the Internet. The market was taking off. I opened in Germany in 97, in, uh, took over a, a French company in 98, and in 1999 started a 50-50 partnership with a woman uh, who had hired me to run uh, a business here in Germany a while back, started with her in England, and by 2003, that group of companies was doing around 7 million euros in revenue, and we sold it to Avanquest Software. They were about 35 million, we were seven, so 42 together gave me a board seat. I still sit on the board of directors of Avanquest. I was chief operating officer for Europe for about five years there, and uh, we, are, we went from the 45, 42 million to between 90 and 100 million this year. And somewhere along the way, I got an opportunity to give some lectures about entrepreneurship, met Professor Harhoff, from, who has the innovation chair here, and he let me start lecturing. Then in 2006, they were looking for someone to start an entrepreneurship center. I took the job. I did that a couple of years pro bono. We now have an incubator where we've started 70 companies in the last four years. We teach in all 18 faculties of the university, and we have a community of about 10,000 uh, different people. I'm married, I have a 16-year-old daughter and a 15-year-old son. I write a lot of poetry and I have a black Havanese silk dog named Gigi. <laughs> okay, so I don't know if you can read that, but what it says is it says three minutes and 0 .3 seconds. So I took an extra 0 .3 seconds of your time, yeah, and I'm aware of that. Now, why am I showing this? I'm not showing this because it's so amazing that I can tell my life story in three minutes. I can tell the same story in 30 seconds or I can tell the same story in a minute. Yeah? Or I can spend probably hours talking about it if you want. The point is that for an entrepreneur, the two most important resources that you have as an entrepreneur, in my opinion, are, and not necessarily in this order, but number one, your time, and number two is your word. You see, we all know for sure, 100%, you cannot get your time back. And actually, it's almost impossible to get your word back. Now, there was a guy here in Germany who was, looked like he was going to become the chancellor of the country, and now he's not in the country anymore, right? You all know who I'm talking about. Now, and that basically was, you know, a broken promise. And that's very hard to change, very, very hard to change. So it's not really the question of, you know, do I want to fail? It's the question of what does success mean? What does success mean to you? To you and you and you because it's different for you than it is for you than it is for you and every other person in the room. Success is not the same. And the less clear I am about what I really want to achieve with my life, with my business, with my time, the less chance I'm going to have of actually achieving that. And the real question is, what are you willing to give up in order to have the success that you claim you want to have? See, because you know, if you're listening to this lecture right now, and by evidence all of you are, yeah, very good universities that are running this course. You know, as far as people in the world and the opportunities that they have, you all are definitely in the top 1%. You have more connections to more people, you have better education yeah, than probably 99% of the rest of the population. So you can, in fact, get what you want. You can be successful. Yeah, the only thing is, you know, so what I'm saying is you can get from A to B. You know, you, and you're here and you want to get there. You can get there. And the only thing is you think you're going to get there this way. And unfortunately, you're going to get there more like this. Yeah, bad news, good news, isn't that great, isn't that horrible, oh shit, oh no, oh great, yeah. So what is it that, look, I gave up my country. I don't live in the United States anymore. It's a nice place. 
Yeah. I gave up my friends. I have no friends in the United States anymore. I haven't, you know, I mean, it's not that I don't have people who I would call if I went there, but it's not like I hang out with them on Saturday night. I didn't give up my family. I talked to my sister and my brother almost every day and my mother every week, but I don't see them all the time. Yeah, so what are you willing to give up to, to have what you want to have? And how do, you, how do you actually become what you want to be? See, my, what I've noticed is that a lot of people have this thinking, they have a thinking in their head that time is really serial. Yeah, like in other words, well, I want to become something and therefore first I'm going to go to school and then I'm going to get into a good university and after I get a good university I'm going to get an internship and after the internship I'm going to get a job and then I'm going to get some experience and then I'm going to learn how to get the money then I'm going to know the right people and then I'm going to start my company or do whatever it is I finally really wanted to do. <laughs> right? Time is serial, right? But what I'm saying is I don't think time is serial. I think time is parallel. You see, it might be the case, it might be the case that there are more people in these four walls right now sitting around you. You may be right now in this program surrounded by more smart, excited, creative people than you're ever going to be surrounded by again for the rest of your life. Yeah? I mean, it doesn't look like this out there when you get into the job world, you know? It doesn't look like this. It looks real different. Yeah? And so, maybe the things you need to do the things that you want to do are right under your nose and they're right here right now. But if you've got this conversation going on in your head which says, well, first I need 20 years to do what I'm going to do and then I'm going to finally do what I'm going to want to do. That is going to stop you from doing what it is that you're really dedicated to doing. And that's an, that's an important conversation. You see, because, look, I, I came here in 1983. I came to Germany. And it was a, it was a pretty, pretty rough start. You know, I, I graduated college and I had studied entrepreneurship. My college roommate came up with this really you know, interesting idea to start a software company. I had never used software whatsoever, even to this day. I'm not a software guy. I've been in the software business now for 30 years. Yeah. But I was a business guy, and I had studied international business, and I had been in Philadelphia since the day I was born, and I was ready to go. And so when he showed up and said, look, what else could you do where in two years from now, this time, you'll be a multimillionaire just like Bill Gates? I said, you know what? You're right. What a great idea. And then I realized we needed some money, so I went to my dad, and I said, hey, dad, I've started a software company. And he says, you started a what? A software company. What's software? <laughs> uh, well, you know, it's a program for a computer. He says, you never studied programming. You don't know anything about a computer. I said, I know. He said, so what's the software company? I said, well, we're going to take software from the United States and we're going to translate it into German and we're going to, I'm, I'm moving to Germany. And he said, what? He said, you don't even speak any German. I said, I know, but I'm going to learn. He said, I just want you to know, this is the stupidest idea I've ever heard. Yeah? What is it? You want to just go to Europe and go skiing or something? I would be willing to finance that, and then you come back and go to law school. Because I had been accepted into law school. That was, and my plan was that I was going to take a year off, and in the year I was going to go over to Europe, and Germany was the place I was going to go to. And I was going to get the European empire up and running. And my partner was going to stay in America. And he was going to find all the software. And he'd get the American empire running. And then we would switch places. I would come back and go to law school. He would come over to Germany and run the European empire. And two or three years, by the time I was out of law school, I'd be a multimillionaire. And I could use my law degree for things in business. <laughs> great plan, huh? Really great plan. Yeah, and my dad said, that's just, that's just ridiculous. Yeah, so basically I said, so I, he said, he said I, I don't think you should do this. And I said to him, I said, look, I know you don't think I should do this, but I'm not actually asking you for your opinion. I'm just asking you for your money. <laughs> he said, well, you got my opinion and you're definitely not getting my money. 
So what did he say? He basically said no. Okay, so let's look at that for a second. What do you think, because this is about the way you think, what do you think that the word no means? Can anyone tell me the definition of the word no, please? Yeah? No, no is different in Europe than it is in America? No, no, I mean, your dad's opinion was different than your opinion. My dad's, so no means that somebody has a different opinion. What else does no mean? That's not a great definition, but go ahead. It's uh, probably a rejection of the question. Or a, or probably a rejection of the question. I like that answer. I like that answer a lot. Now, here's the amazing thing. You see, I bet you there's not too many people in this room that are 30 years old. Okay, you don't have to raise your hand. But I bet there's not. You have an idea what no means? Or was you just raising your pen there? Ah. <laughs> I have an idea, not agreeing yet. Like. Not agreeing yet. Yeah. That's getting closer, you see. And what I was going to say was, if I had asked you this question like 15 years ago when you were all like around whatever, 10 to let's say 15 or 16, like when you were kids, you would all know what no means. Here, let me make it easier for you. What did it mean when mom said no? <laughs> now everybody knows, right? So that's what no means. No just means no for now, right? No means no is a license to negotiate. <laughs> yeah? No does not mean no forever. No just means no for now. But if you think no means no, and then somebody says no, and then you wipe it off the plate and that's the end of it, that's going to get in the way of you being successful. You see, so my father said no. So I said, well, okay, you sure? He said, I'm absolutely sure. So I decided to go to my professor at Wharton, my entrepreneurship professor. Who else would you ask? So I went to him. His name was Miles Bass, great guy. Lost him, unfortunately, recently. And I said, look, Miles, um, I have started this software company, went through the whole thing, and he said, that's a stupid ass idea. I can't believe you're going to do this. He said, are you really going to do this? And I said, I am doing this. I'm not asking you if you think I should do it. I am doing it. I just need $10,000 from you because if I got $10,000 from you, I'm sure I could get the other $90,000 with $100,000. This thing is going to be really big and we're going to be huge. And you know what he looked at me and he said, I don't know why exactly, but you know what? I believe you. So I'm going to give you $10,000. And I was like, yes. So he said, what is your dad? How much is your dad putting in? He knew my dad. And I said, well, my dad thinks it's the stupidest idea he's ever heard. And he said, well, your dad may be right, but let's call your dad. So we pick up the phone. And I said, dad, I'm here with uh, Professor Bass. And uh, he wants to talk to you. So he says, hi, Rick. This is Miles. Hi. He says, listen, Rick, I'm investing $10,000 in your son's company. How much are you investing? And my dad was so shocked, you know, that I had gotten this, this professor to believe. I had given this professor the ability, given him the ability to believe that what I was doing was worth $10,000 of his money. My father said, are you serious? He said, yeah, I'm serious. He said, well, look, if you're going to put in $10,000, then I guess I'll put in $10,000 too. And I was like, yes. And we had $20,000. And then we pulled that trick on my grandfather. And then we pulled the trick on my partner's brother and my partner's father. And I walked out of that business meeting with $50,000. But really, all because, why? Well, because one person had said, I believe, you see? And so that's why I write here, reference power. What is the power of a reference? How important is somebody's word. I mean, it was just his word. By the way, I have a little bit of bad news, a little bit of failure. One thing, when somebody promises you money, make sure you get the money. Do not wait to get the money. When people say, I will give you the money, then get it. Because it's not yours, it's until it's in your bank account and they're not allowed to take it back. Now, unfortunately, what happened to me was I then moved over to I actually ended up going to Austria to begin with, Vienna. Why? Because my father had said, look, if you're going to go at least go, I know somebody in Vienna, his name is Sepp. He's a, used to be a great ski instructor and now he's a very famous attorney and Sepp will help you out a little bit. And I did and Sepp gave me a car and an apartment for a couple weeks until he realized I was staying, at which point I had to pay for it. 
Yeah, so I ended up in Austria, you know, and I started getting things going, and I started telling people I'm starting the software company, I've started the software company. And it wasn't particularly easy, it wasn't going particularly well. But after a year of doing that, I had the thing going, and I went back and I started law school. And then when I, on the second day of law school, I called Miles and I said, Miles, you know, I wasn't really spending the money while I was there. I was just spending my own money because I didn't have a business going. So, but now my partner's over here and he's signing contracts and he actually, we actually need the money. So could you give me that $10,000? And he said, Andy, you don't really think that I'm going to put $10,000 into a company where the guy who I'm investing in is sitting in law school? in Philadelphia, and there's this other guy who I don't even know who's somewhere where there's kangaroos. I said, no, no, Austria, not Australia. He said, yeah, 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 Austria. And he said, that's ridiculous. Just go to law school. You made the right decision. And when you're finished law school, we'll make a lot of money together. Hello, failure. Hi there. And so I thought about it for a couple of days and I called him back two days later and I said, Miles, it's Andy again. He said, hi. I said, I need the $10,000. And he said, we had this conversation two days ago. And I said, yeah, but this morning I dropped out of law school. And then he was silent. He's like, you what? I said, I dropped out of law school. And I need the $10,000. Yeah, because I had given a lot of people my word yeah, and I was willing to deal with the failure of not going to law school. And by the way, for about 10 years, I really thought, while my company was going like this, I really thought I had made the wrong decision. Yeah, I mean, it doesn't look great along the way. It sounds nice in the lecture, but it's not really so great. And then I got the money. And then I moved back and we got the company going. You know, but this idea of failure, what are you willing to give up? How, what do you think? What is it that you really, really want to do? And who are you doing for it? Who are you doing it for? You know, are you doing it because you're, why are you sitting here? Are you sitting here because your mother thinks it's a great idea? Because your dad told you this is an important thing to do? Yeah, or are you sitting here because you put yourself here? Yeah, and are you going to start your company because you want to start your company? Or are you going to not start your company because somebody told you it's a bad idea? Because you know, when I got here in 1983, there was a big net set up in the country. Now, some of you know this, and have seen, heard me say this, but it was 12 years before the internet. I was here in 1983, and the internet started basically in 95. But there was a big net set up in Germany, and there's still a big net in the country. And this net is what we're trying to take down at the Entrepreneurship Center. And I'm not talking about the internet. I'm talking about the Hamanet, Kamanet, Gipsnet. It's kennt ihr, oder? Geht net. Das kann man net machen. Haben wir noch net gemacht, machen wir auch net. Das geht net. Bist sowieso zu jung. Ja? Geht net. Hast keine Erfahrung. Kann net machen. Es geht net. Yeah, and you know, people are going to tell you that, it's, honestly, it's, people love to tell students that they can't do it. They just love to tell students that they can't do it. You know, and my question is, when, when, you, when someone's saying, Hamanet, Kamanet, my answer is, says who? Who says Hamanet? For those of you who for some reason don't speak German, Hamanet means you can't do it and we don't have it and net is Irish for nicht. Yeah? Kann man nicht machen. Yeah? But, you know, says who? And my point is that as long as the person who's saying Hamanet, Kamanet, Gipsnet is not you, it's fine. Just go ask the next person. You know, no, GateNet, good, GateNet mit dir, dann geh ich zu jemand anders. Weil es geht schon. You know, and things do not go the way you think they're going to go. And now I tell you really the worst story. And it's really the worst story. Yeah, but it was 1988. And I started the company in 1983, dropped out of law school in 1984, moved back to Austria in 85, 86 moved to Munich, 87 we were kind of still losing money but maybe thinking about breaking even. And 88 we were actually looked like we might break even that year. 
And it was December 12th, 1988, and I was sitting in my office, and the phone rings, and it's my dad. Now, you have to know that my family was in the zipper business. We sold zippers. My great-great-grandfather had come from Russia. He had some zippers and a little push cart. Then my great-great-grandfather, my grandfather went into the business and took it over. And then my father had to go into the business and take it over. And it was a pretty big zipper business. And I was supposed to go into the zipper business. And I said, I'm not going into the zipper business. Actually, my mother said, he's not going into the zipper business. Yeah. My mother is really the entrepreneur in the family. My mother has her own interior design company for the last 40 years. So, you know, and she basically said, Andy, go follow your dreams. Go do what you want to do. Yeah, but my dad was, and he was right behind her. He said, look, it's fine with me if you don't sell zippers. And, and then he actually sold it in 1986, sold the company. In 1988, he calls me and he says, hi, you know, a friend of yours stayed over last night and he wants to say hello. And I used to talk to my dad every day because he was a great business guy. There's a great saying that says, common sense is not often common. And he was someone with amazing common sense. So he didn't know about the, he didn't know about, you know, what to do about the software business, but he knew what to do about business. He was the one that taught me, this is a great saying. This one's really worth writing down. And what he said was, if you do the right thing, how do you know what the right thing is? Here. Yeah, what, when you look in the mirror, is it the right thing for you? Might, not, might be the wrong thing for someone else, but is it the right thing for you to do? See, everybody knows it's not the right thing when somebody sticks a, a, an envelope with 50,000 euros under the table and says, here, give me that contract. That's easy. That's not the right thing. You have to ask yourself, what's the right thing? Is this the right thing for me to be doing? Do I feel good about this? Can I get up in the morning and represent that I said I was going to do this and I stand behind my word. So he said, if you do the right thing all the time, sooner or later you'll be doing the right thing at the right time. Now that's really good advice. And he called me on that day and he said, yeah, your friend's here and he stayed over and we'll see you next week, you're coming over for the holidays. And I said hello to my friend who in fact I had told if he ever was in Philly and wanted to stay at my house, my parents would put him up and he had done that. And my dad said, okay, I'm going to take him to the airport and I'll talk to you, see you next week. And I went back to work and he went off to the airport. And when I got home that evening on December 12, 1988, my partner was sitting in the apartment where we, which we shared. And he was like white, like this, you know, screen here. This, and I said, what's the matter? He said, you better sit down, I have to tell you something. And I sat down and he said, I don't know how to say this, but... On the way back from the airport, your dad got a flat tire and he got out of the car to change the tire and a truck came by and pulled him into the road and there was another truck right behind him and it ran him over and he's gone. Game over. 50 years old. Just like that. And he was gone. Game over. And I'm not telling you that story because I'm looking for your sympathy. I'm telling you that story because I'm telling you time is parallel. You know, a lot of us walk around thinking like we have all the time in the world. We don't have all the time in the world. We do not. None of us have all the time in the world. No one sitting in this class has all the time in the world. Now, I can calculate how long he had. And the really thing that really freaks me out is that since November of last year, I'm older than my dad. Yeah, every day I'm living is more than he lived. So then you ask yourself, you know, what do I want to be? What do I want to become? And get on with it. Because look, how do, how, let's come back to this. How do you become something? See, a lot of people think, a lot of people think it works like this. First you have to have, then you have to do, and then you have to be, come. So for example, an easy example would be, I'm a father, I have a little girl, and like all fathers, I want my little daughter to be, I only do this one time a lecture, watch carefully, I want her to become a what? A, here we go, a ballerina, right? So, I want her to become a ballerina, so first she has to have what the ballerina has, so I get a little 
pink tutu and a little pink bag, right? And then she has to go do what the ballerina does. So she goes to ballet class. Yeah, and then I go watch her at the recital at Christmas time. Yeah, and eventually she will become a ballerina. Except almost none of those little girls ever become ballerinas. And what I'm saying is that being an entrepreneur and in acts of creation, it works exactly the other way around. You see, you give your word that you are starting this company and you make the declaration, I have started this company, and in the split second that you make that declaration, you become an entrepreneur. And because you are an entrepreneur, well then everything you do is in fact what an entrepreneur does by definition. It might not be great, yeah? it might not be Google, but it's clearly what an entrepreneur does because you are an entrepreneur and if you do it long enough, you will have what an entrepreneur has. You know, if someone were to ask me, it's 2000, Two. So next year will be, uh, uh, excuse me, 2012, next year will be 2013. So it'll be 30 years that I've been doing this next year. And if somebody had come to me and said, you know, 29 years ago, where do you want to be in 29 years? I probably would have said, well, I'd like to be a successful entrepreneur who sold his company for enough money to do pretty much whatever he wants to do. I'd like to be able to travel around Europe. I'd probably like to live in Europe, have a nice car, be married to a beautiful wife, have nice kids who I love and have time to spend with. And maybe I'd like to lecture at a university and be involved in different companies. And you know what? When I actually look, I have to say, hey, I, I got it. I got what I wanted. But if they had come with the contract, and the contract had said, sign here, and you'll get all this, yeah? And then I read the fine print, and it said, accident, 1988. Comp you know what happened after the accident? After the accident, I decided to move back to the United States to be with my family. My partner stayed, and we were great together, but we weren't good apart. And the company started tanking. We started losing more and more money. And in 1991, the professor who was on our board looked and said, you know, you guys looks to me like you're bankrupt. I said, we're not bankrupt. We have plenty of cash in the bank. He said, yeah, you have cash in the bank because you have a bank loan and because you're not paying people on time. I said, oh, he said, you know, you better go back to Germany and close that company. So I went back to Germany to close the company. And I got here and I learned a new word in German called Konkursverschleppung. <laughs> yeah? And, and back then, it was the case that if you were insolvent for more than six weeks, now it's only three weeks, right? If you're insolvent and you know you're insolvent, meaning you can't pay your bills, if you close the company on that day, it's the definition of insolvency, then all of a sudden you're not protected by the laws of a corporation, by the GMBH laws anymore. And then I realized, oh, I have an interesting opportunity. Either I get on the plane tomorrow and never come back, because if I come back, they have this great program here where you get free room and board. <laughs> but I didn't think German jail was going to really excite me. Yeah, or I better clean this up. Yeah, and I had to clean it up. And I had to fire half the company on one day. And what happens when you give people your word that you're going to give them a job and then you walk in and you say, I'm sorry, I have to fire you? Does that mean you should never give your word? And so what I did was I said, look, you know, the company is running out of money. And if we don't cut the size of the company in half immediately, we're going to have to close the company and everybody loses their job. So unfortunately, these are the people who are staying and these are the people who are not staying. Now anyone who's not staying, I'd be more than happy to help you find another job. With that, about five of the people got up and walked out of the room and I never saw them again. And the other three came and said, okay, help me find a job. And I did. And the, the amazing thing is that one of the guys who I actually found a job, 15 years later became my biggest client made millions and millions of euros with that company. Yeah, so, you know, what does an entrepreneur really have to do all day? If I had to say what an entrepreneur does all day in one word, just one word, the word would be this, decide. 
an entrepreneur has to decide. People come to me all day and say, should I do this? Should I do that? Yes, no, yes, no, yes, no, maybe, come to me tomorrow, yes, no, good idea, talk to him. Decide, 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 decide. Do I know that all my decisions are going to be right? I mean, for sure I know that all my decisions are not going to be right. But what I tell people is, you know, I try and hire smart people in the company. You're smart or I wouldn't have hired you. Yeah, I'm smart. 90% of the time, 90% of the time I'm going to make the right decision. And 10% of the time I'm going to make the wrong decision. And of the 10 which are wrong, I'm going to be smart enough to fix half, and the other 5% are just going to be wrong. Now hopefully they're not the, hopefully they're not critical errors. Critical errors are errors that if you make them, you're out of business. But they might be. But make a decision. Make a decision. And then stand by your decision. You see, it's like when you get married, has everyone ever listened to the words? It goes something like this. Do you take this person to be your lawfully wedded husband or wife as long as you feel like it? Right? Isn't that how it goes? Yeah, the real words are, for better or for worse, till death do you part. That's pretty, pretty, that's pretty strong. Now, my dad also taught me that the most, and this is, if you, if you get nothing else out of the lecture, Nothing else. This is really important. The mo and I'm sure he's right about this, the, long the older I am. The most important decision you make in your life is who you marry. So, for all of you except for these two and me, you all have a big decision coming. Yeah? And one day you will have to decide. Yeah? And is that person going to be the exact right person every single day? Hell no! Yeah, and that's why when a lot of, a lot of uh, people in, uh, around the university, students, ask me about for career advice. And they often say, what do you think I should do? And my answer to them is really straightforward. It is, do what you love to do. Do something you love to do. Now, don't, if you don't love it, just don't do it. And you know why? Because when, you, when what you love really sucks, and it will, you will not give up. Yeah, but if you don't love it, then a lot of other things start looking a lot better. You know, so decide what you're committed to. You know, if you want to, if it, see, I thought I wanted to be a lawyer. All I can say is one of the luckiest things that ever happened to me was I didn't become a lawyer because I would have been a horrible lawyer. Now I know brilliant lawyers and lots of people love being lawyers, but when I look at lawyers, I see people who sit around all day thinking about things that never happen. They read contracts and they make sure that this won't happen and this won't happen and this won't happen and this won't happen. And they're brilliant. I mean, that's not what all lawyers do, yeah? but they must love doing it. I would be absolutely crazy if I did that all day. But what I should have done is, I should have gone to work in a law firm. So what I'm saying is, you know, if you think you want to do something, why are you not doing it? If you really think and you really know in your heart that this is something that you want to do, why are you not doing it now? Now, if you think you want to start a company, why not go take an internship in a startup? Now, if you think you want to be a physicist, why not go get a job in a physics lab this summer? Now, why not get into it? I mean, I often tell people, I'm not saying that everybody should go out and start their own company. I'm really not. In fact, you know, if my son were to say, do you think I should start my own company? I would say, look, go pick a field of work that you absolutely love and go work in that company as though it was your own company. First of all, because those are the kind of people that rise up really fast in a company. It's very hard to find people in a company who are willing to take responsibility for their own actions. People are very good at doing this. Very few people are good at doing this. Yeah, so if you, if you think you want to do something, well, maybe you ought to get it out there and do it. 
I mean, if we take, if we take this course as an example, it's, you're doing basically business plans. You're writing, you're creating ideas in this course. You're trying to put them into action. Yeah? And there's something, what you really have to watch out for are critical errors. A critical error, again, is an error which if you make it, the whole business doesn't work. So, as an example, a critical error would be this. Um, you're making glasses, and the, you decide that the glass is going to cost a dollar. And since you have to sell millions of them, because you have a business plan to make 10 million euros revenue in five years, then you're going to have to find a distributor for the glass. So you write in your business plan 40% discount. So now one euro minus 40% for the distributor leaves you with 60%. You factor in all your costs and everything, and you realize that it's only going to cost you 50 to run the company and everything, fixed cost, the whole thing on the average, 50 cents. And 60 minus 50 is 10. And 10 of the 60 that you get to keep, uh, that you get, is 16% profit margin. Now, I wish my software company did 16% profit margin. That's great profit margin. Now, here's a critical error. You now go out and you raise venture capital, right? And you bring in all this money and you go out and you hire the people and you start, you build a plant even and you get the, the glasses going. And now you go out into the market and you find out as you're, when you're ready to sell the product that the dollar is right, the euro price is right, but there is not one single distributor in the entire market that will even consider giving you a contract for less than 60% discount because that's the way the market works. That's the reality of the market. And you can kick and scream and do everything you want, and you can think anything you want, but people don't do it. People don't pay. People don't buy cups with 40% discount. They buy them with 60% discount. And now, 100 minus 60 leaves you with 40, and you got all the costs right in your great business plan, and 40 minus 50 is minus 10, and minus 10 out of the 40 you get is minus 25%, and before you know it, you're out of business. And so my point about that is, how do you avoid, how do you avoid critical errors? You do reality checks. Go check. Go check in your business plan, in this course, if what you think the assumptions that you are making are in fact true assumptions. Don't wait around. Yeah, if you're doing a business plan and your business plan is about making cups, then go call your number one competitor and pick up the phone and say, hi, could you tell me all your trade secrets? And what will they probably say? No, right. They'll say no. So call the next one. And then maybe you change your pitch because maybe that's not a good pitch. And that's also being an entrepreneur is using everything to your advantage. Yeah, I mean, that's why I have here Trojan horse. Everybody knows the story of the Trojan horse. You know, don't why don't you call the next competitor and say, and be honest and say, look, I'm calling, I'm in a class at the LMUTU here in Munich it's called CDTM. We're doing projects and we're analyzing exactly your market. Would you be willing to have a conversation with me and tell me if all my assumptions are right? And at the end, I'll give you a copy of the report. And you know what? They might just do it. They might just do it. But if you're telling yourself, no, they won't talk to me, they're not going to give me the information, then you know what? You won't even ask. And now you start to see that I'm trying to say the same thing again and again and again, and I keep coming back to the same point, which is, how do you think? What is going on in your head? So I'll give you one of my very favorite examples about thinking. Okay? And let's go back to, let's see again how you think, okay? So I give you a little information first, which I think is important, and then I'm going to ask a question. Okay? So in real estate, it's often said that there's three important things. Anybody know what they are? It's kind of a little joke. Yes, exactly. The three most important things in real estate are location, location, location. Laga, 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 right? So in venture capital, anybody know what the three most important things that they say in venture capital is? Any guesses? Any guesses? No? What? Yeah, exactly. Management, management, management. You see, because these are people who 
venture capitalists invest in less than 1% of all the plans they look at. So that means that 100 people are walking into their office and they got to pick the one and they all have great ideas and they all have amazing business plans and they have to pick the one guy or the one gal that's going to make them 10 times their money. So the three most important things for them is no matter how great the idea is, people, people, people. I'm investing in the people and they'll tell you that again and again. So I'm telling you now, and here's the answer to the question, okay? The three most, everybody here wants to be in business in some way or another. Right? It's a business class. So we know that. We know that you all think you want to be in business. Anybody here doesn't want to ever do business in their life? Yeah, oh, great. What are you doing here? Politics. Politics. You don't think politics is business? Okay, we'll come back to that. The three most important things in business are written up on the board. Anybody want to guess what they are? Yeah. Sell, sell, sell. Sales. Sales are the most important thing in business. Sales. Okay? A very smart man once told me, and I, the older I get, again, the more I know he's right, is that there is no problem you will ever have in business that profitable sales cannot handle. Profitable sales. Now, I'm not saying to go out on the corner and sell a euro for 98 cents. That's not profitable sales. That's charity. And there's nothing wrong with charity as long as you do it on purpose. That's just losing money. I'm talking about having a euro and selling it for two euros. That at the end, you have, you have two euros in your pocket. Why? Because there's a saying which is that cash is king. Yeah? Cash is king. If you have cash, cash is equal to freedom. If you have cash in your business, you don't need to ask people for money. You don't need to report back into anyone. You don't need to go to the bank. You can make your own decisions. So as long as you make enough money, you can solve all your problems. Okay, so I'm telling you that the three most important things in business are sales, sales, sales. Okay? Everybody got that? Now you may or may not believe me, but let me know in about 20 years. Okay? So now I ask a question, and now we want to see how you think, okay? So get ready just for a second, just play along. We only have like 15 minutes left of this. It'll be over soon, right? So I'm going to ask a question, and if the answer to the question is yes, I want you really fast to put your hand up, okay? So just get ready, because you might want to say yes to this question. Okay, here we go. Who wants to be a salesperson? Ah, one, two, three, four out of 27. Five! That's really interesting. Isn't that interesting? I, I stand here and I say the most important thing in business is sales, right? You all believe that I'm worth listening to and I ask the question, who wants to be a salesperson? And four people in a class of 27 raise their hand. What are the rest of you thinking? What are you thinking about sales? I don't want to be a salesperson. You don't want to be a salesperson. Why don't you want to be a salesperson? Honestly. I'd rather deal with the other things. <laughs> I think there's more things and more. The, I want to deal with the important things. That's a good no, thought. No. Uh, a jerk. Uh, what? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Why don't you want to be a salesperson? Uh, I want to add up on Hannah's point. So I believe not any person can do everything, and I know my strong skills, so I concentrate on my strong skills. I'm not. I'm, I'm not. I'm not. I'm not made to be a salesperson. <laughs> I'm not made to be a salesperson. You're, I am not, I'm not made to be a salesperson. Any other great ones? Any other good ones? Are you a physicist? I'm not a physicist. And you're not, I mean, you don't have the skills to be a No, but I'm not talking about being a physicist. I'm saying who wants to be a salesperson and we're in a business class. And I'm telling you that you have this, you personally have a conversation going on in your head called, I'm not very good at sales, therefore somebody else should do it. And what all I'm saying is, it's the only point I'm making, is that that conversation is A, not true, yeah? and B, is going to get in the way of being an entrepreneur. You see, because you are a good salesperson. Yeah? If you are the entrepreneur, you are able to sell your company. And by the way, you are a salesperson whether you like it or not. You see, except for me and this young woman here and this young woman here, all of you, whether you like it or not, have a big sale coming, right? 
Yeah, I mean, I can only speak for the men, but guys, I have to tell you, it doesn't work like this. You don't walk up to her and say, I really, really, really am thinking a lot hard kind of of maybe marrying you. <laughs> yeah, that's not, that doesn't work. Yeah, that, that, she does not say yes <laughs> when you say that. You know, try it more like, look, I'm absolutely committed to you for better or for worse, so death do you part. I love you madly, and I want you to be my wife, and I want you to be with me for the rest of my life. She might still say, no, ask her again. Yeah, I mean, I'm just trying to, I don't, I'm not trying to debate the, the, the fineness of the concept. I am just saying that are you looking at the conversations that are going on in your own head about the things that you really want to get done? And are you checking that the things that you're telling yourself are really Correct? Let's take, a, let's take a real example. Let's, use, let's stay with sales for a second. Imagine that you wanted to start a health club company, something in the field of health, right? Anybody doing a health club plan here? Anybody doing a business in health? I know one person who is. Yeah? Anybody else? No health plans? Okay, let's say imagine, imagine you wanted to start a health club, right? And you, why do you write a business plan? What is a business plan? Anybody tell me? What kind of a document is a business plan, really? You're trying to convey your idea to yourself. You really don't like that word either, right? You don't like the word. Can you just ex exchange convey with another word that's up here? Could you just try it? it says. Yes, exactly. Thank you. Yes. You are trying to sell. You are trying to sell people on the idea. Yeah? You are trying to sell it. A, sales, a, a business plan is a sales document. I know it's like a bad word, right? I know, but try it, yeah? Okay? And look, I am not saying to go sell stuff that you do not believe in. I'm really not saying that. I'm saying quite the opposite. I'm saying do something that you really love and give your word and stand behind your word no matter what happens, yeah? And then when you sell something that you believe in, the other people will believe you too. Yeah, that's what I'm saying about sales. And I'm saying that if you have a thought going on in your head saying, oh, sales is bad and I don't like salespeople and salespeople are used car salespeople and, and salespeople sell people crap they don't need anyway. Yeah, that conversation is going to really get in the way of you being effective in what it is that you want to do. I mean, look, even if you don't want to start your own company, then all of you are going to have to go out and find a job. I love these interviews where the people walk in. I interview a lot of people and I love the ones that walk in and I say, so why do you want to work? And they say, Oh, I think it's a really, really great company. And I think I could really add a lot. <laughs> really? Why? Well, I'm a I'm very powerful speaker. <laughs> I'm really full of energy. Uh, I love your products. <laughs> Next. Yeah, I mean, if you want the job, go in and let them know that you want the job. Say, look, I've researched this inside and out. I know everything there is to know about your company except what it's like to work in it. Yeah? And I'm committed to making a difference in this company and I really want the job. They might say no, but, you know, at least you give it your best shot. So imagine you want to start a health club, right? And you write the business plan and we know that 100, out of 100 business plans, the venture capitalists throw away 99, right? But don't you think that if on the cover of your business plan it said health club, just said health club, didn't even say anything else, but underneath it there was a line that said this is the single best health club plan I've seen in the last 30 years and it was signed Arnold Schwarzenegger, don't you think that that would help? Of course it would. Look, if you want to be a politician, don't you think that if you had a plan, a great political plan, and you wrote it all up, and on the bottom it said, this is the best plan for foreign politics I've seen in my life, and it was signed Hillary Clinton? Yeah? So look, you know, if, you, if it was your health club plan, would you be picking up the phone and calling Arnold Schwarzenegger? Who would call Arnold Schwarzenegger? A couple people. Okay, that's good. I mean... Would you call Hillary Clinton if you were writing a plan on foreign policy or, yeah? Who would? One or two. But the rest of you, but look, the rest of you wouldn't. That's my point. You see, you wouldn't call Arnold Schwarzenegger. Why, why would you not call Arnold Schwarzenegger? Really? Basically, 
Yeah. I think it's not that pressing for me because the argument is not that strong. The argument's not that strong. Arnold Schwarzenegger wouldn't help with a health club plan. All right, I'll go for that. Why wouldn't you call Arnold Schwarzenegger? Because uh, I don't know. I don't know Arnold Schwarzenegger. How about you? Um, well, um, yeah, I don't know him. Yes. I don't know him. Hey, right? uh, why about you? So going on your argument that time is limited, Arnold Schwarzenegger is not the right person for you. Uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger's not the right guy. He's the wrong guy. Yeah, and Hillary Clinton also. She's also not good. Yeah. And, and probably they wouldn't pick up the phone anyway, right? Who thinks, who could, who could pick up the phone? Let's just see. Let's just check this. Everybody know the six degrees of separation? It's the concept that if you call somebody who calls somebody who calls somebody who calls somebody, that with six calls you can reach anybody on the planet? Yeah? It's kind of social networking, if you will. So who, is there, just out of curiosity, is there anyone, let's look at the resource we have right here in this room, see? A lot of you think that you couldn't reach them, right? You can't get to those people. Who could, with one telephone call, look in their telephone and directly call Arnold Schwarzenegger or Hillary Clinton? Anybody? One call, direct call. You know them. Anybody know them directly, personally? Okay. So no, no direct calls. Anybody, anybody could make one call? Anybody who could make one call and reach either of those people? Anybody think they could reach them if they called one other person that they really know? How about two? You know somebody who knows somebody? Oh, and now the hands start going up. So three people. How about three calls? Now I know you're all smart. But let's see how long it takes. How about four people? Five people? Now you see everybody obviously has their hand up by now, right? Because you just call him. He can get it in two calls, right? <laughs> so you call him. He calls one person who calls one person. There's Arnold and Hillary on the phone, just like that. <laughs> You see, look, but what I'm trying to get at is, you see, you think, you think you can't do it. And by the way, you know, you're wrong anyway. Yeah? Because you could call me, and I grew up with Mark, and Mark is now married to Chelsea, and I guess Chelsea could, I'd probably get her, get Hillary on the phone, because she's Chelsea's mom. Yeah? And Mark would take my call. And it's just by chance. It's not, you know, particularly impressive that I happen to know somebody who's married to Hillary Clinton's daughter, but did you know that? You see, and that's what I'm saying, is that the resources, the things that you need are probably right around you, but you are not picking them up. They're right here. Yeah? As, as a student at CDTM, at the LMU or the TU, you can call an amazing number of people who will help you in unbelievable ways if you ask them. But, it, I mean, there are people who love to help students. Yeah, I'm one of them. I help students all the time. And I don't get paid for helping students on a regular basis. I don't get paid, by the way, I don't get paid for being here right now. I'm just doing it because I think it's a good thing to do. Somebody else wanted me to do it. I told them, yeah, I'll be happy to come. It costs $2,500 and I'll be at your company. And they didn't want me to come. Yeah, but my point is, my point is, and I am coming to the end. I know you were wondering what was going to happen, but... You know, what are you telling yourself? What are you thinking? And how is that thinking getting in the way of you getting and achieving what it is you really want to achieve? And so I want to kind of wrap this up with a, um, with a thought. And the thought is this. It's called, it's actually a business concept, and it's called the quantum leap. So some of you are physicists, right? Who's the physicist? Okay, this is not the quantum leap in physics. I don't know about that. Yeah, yeah, okay, so it's, it's not that one. Maybe there's some similarities, I don't know, you tell me afterwards, but the, the quantum leap is a business concept, and the business concept is this. This is, you don't have to write it down because it's pretty easy to remember, but it's no more time plus no more energy equals a huge breakthrough in productivity. Okay, who believes me? Oh, it was not a bad lecture after all. Okay. Right? So no more time plus no more energy equals a huge breakthrough in productivity. Yeah. And what I'm saying is that in order to have a quantum leap, you need two things. Number one, you need to know that a quantum leap is really possible. And number two, you have to be looking for it. So what I mean by knowing something, I mean that like... The first level of knowing, they often say, is knowing that you don't know. 
Right? If you don't know that you don't know, it's hard to find it out. Or like, you know, if you, if you say to your friend, let's go running today, right? And you, I'll pick you up at work and you get to his office and he's not ready. And not only is he not ready, he forgot his running shoes. So he says, I'm really sorry. I'll tell you what, my apartment's around the corner. Here's my key. And he takes this big ring of keys and he starts looking through it and he takes that one, he takes the one key off. He goes, I'll buy the beer afterwards. Just go grab my sneakers and when you're back, we'll go running. So you go down the street, around the corner, up the three flights of stairs, and you stick the key in the door, and it's the wrong damn key. And you jiggle the door, but he obviously gave you the wrong key. And now you're really pissed. So you walk all the way down the stairs, and around the corner, and back, and you slam the key on the desk, and you say, you jerk, you gave me the wrong key. And he picks the key up, and he looks at it, and he says, I've been using this key for the past 10 years. This is the right key. Just go get me my running shoes. Yeah? And now, with the same exact key that you had in your hand before, you walk back and the only thing that's different is you know that it's the right key. And because you know that it's the right key, you stick it in and you jiggle the door until finally the door opens. I mean, look, think about it this way. Did you ever think about how amazing it is that the day before you go on vacation, you get all this work done? Isn't that like amazing? I mean, you don't have any more time that day. You certainly don't have any more energy. You're probably even more exhausted than usual. But somehow you just get all this work done. Or, or here, you, I know you're all students. So isn't it amazing how like somehow magically like a week before the paper is due, the, the paper you've been trying to write all semester, or sometimes even the night before the paper is due, you just miraculously with less time and almost no energy sit down and write the paper? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, isn't that amazing? So you have to be looking for the quantum leap. You have to be looking to say, you know, sometimes things just get naturally better in your life. You meet somebody or something crazy happens and things just get better, but not on purpose. Yeah? And what I, so here's the example of the quantum leap, a, a metaphor so that everybody understands what I'm talking about. You're sitting in your office and there is a fly flying around the office. And this is an amazing fly because the fly flies against the window six, seven times every minute. Ba-doom, 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 right? So what would be the quantum leap for the fly? No more time plus no more energy. And you know what's gonna happen, you know the outcome, right? The outcome will be that tomorrow the fly will be dead on the windowsill right there, right? So the quantum leap for the fly would be this, that in between revolution number six, when he, or in many of your cases, she, bangs against the window, boom, and then he or she backs up, that in that split second of time, that is so little time, that it's really no time, and with so little energy that it's not even measurable, it's no energy, the fly simply bzz, turns 90 degrees. And now, with the same time and the same energy, the fly flies out the open door right there. Psst. That's all. And so what I want to leave you with is a question. And the question is not, why was the fly flying against the window? We know why the fly was flying against the window. Because the fly didn't see the window. What do... But here's the thing. See, I don't, know, I don't know any of you, right? So the question here is not, why was the fly flying against the window? The question is, what's your window? What is your window that you are flying against every single day that is keeping you from getting the girl you want, getting the guy you want, getting the job you want, starting the company that you want, having the success that you want, doing the things that you want to do, what is the window that you are flying against every day where if you knew it was a window, if you saw the window, at least you would stop flying against it. And since I don't know any of you, really, and probably will never have the chance to because none of you will call me, uh, even though you all know how to reach me, yeah? almost nobody ever calls. Every once in a while somebody does and you know, I do my best to help them if I can, yeah? But most of you won't, just leave that. You're not gonna call Arnold Schwarzenegger, so you're sure not gonna call me, okay? 
So I don't know you and you don't know me, so I, don't, I certainly don't pretend to know what your window is. But what I can do is I can tell you where to look to find your own window. And where you look is this. Fish swim in water. But the fish don't see the water. So what do we swim in? What do people swim in that we don't see? Any guesses? Our social connections. Our social connections. Another way of saying that would be... Now, what are, we, what are you swimming in right now that you don't see? Right now. Thoughts. Yeah. Thoughts. Yeah, people swim in conversations. And if you don't, anyone who doesn't know which conversation I'm talking about, it's the one right now in the back of your head that's saying, what conversation is he talking about? And wasn't he going to end this lecture at 8 o'clock? And well, what's going on? And I don't want to be a salesperson anyway. <laughs> <laughs> so look at the conversations. Look at the things you're telling yourself. Yeah, they do matter. They are important. And the last concept that I leave you with is one which is what I call an automatic system for dealing with failure because we all know that failure is coming and an automatic system is a system that works every time without you doing anything. Yeah? And so an example of an automatic system would be this. I know myself. I absolutely hate to get up in the morning. I hate it. So what do I do? I take my alarm clock every night and I put it into the shower. Why? Because I know that Irina is going to kick me when the alarm clock goes off and I'm going to have to walk all the way down the hall. And by the time I get there and I take the alarm clock, it's going to be so much easier just to put it on the shelf and flip on the water and take one step and then everything will be fine and it works every morning. And I think to myself every night when I'm putting it in the shower, I can't believe I'm doing this. <laughs> yeah? And so what I have written here is two things. Number one, if I had to say everything that I know about business in only one sentence, it would be this sentence right here. And this sentence is also an automatic system for dealing with failure. And the sentence is, every breakdown is the opportunity for the breakthrough. And it's not my sentence. It's a sentence I heard and I like a lot. But what word in this sentence makes it an automatic system? What's the most important word in this? Every. Yes. Exactly. Every. This is the most important word. Because you see, and why don't you just try it, just for this semester. Why don't you just try it, just for this class. If every time in the class something goes wrong, yeah, and I'm talking about, and you've heard about a lot of things that have gone wrong in my life, and bad stuff happens, yeah, bad stuff happens to good people, yeah, and things don't go the way you want, but if every time something goes wrong, Every time. I'm not talking about solving the problems that you like. Oh, I like this problem. I think I'll solve this one. No. I'm talking about that every time that something really goes wrong, you go, instead of going, oh my God, it's failure. You say, there was that crazy American guy who showed up in that room and said all that stuff, and he said that every breakdown is the opportunity for the breakthrough. Now somewhere in this breakdown must be the breakthrough. And on that note, we end about an hour and a half, which is what I promised, of entrepreneurial thinking. I appreciate your time and your joining me. And thank you very much. Anybody have a question? Any questions? I would see it in, in some countries when I say you have questions, everyone's like this. Anybody have a question? If you had a question, what would it be? <laughs> <laughs> One question. Yeah. So you said it's important to know what you love? What yes. You, but how do you find out if you don't know? Well, you know, it's a good, that's a good question. And I, yeah, I mean, the place that I would look to find out what you love, I know it sounds very straightforward, is really in your heart. You know, it's like, but here's another place, and I, and I really mean this. I think that a lot of people spend a lot 
much too much time doing things that they're not good at. Why don't you look at what you're really, really, really good at doing? I mean, what you're so good at doing that you don't even think it matters. Yeah? That, like, you think it's not important at all. Like, anybody could do that. It's so easy. But you just happen to do it, like, unbelievable. See, because people tend to devalue what they're really, really good at. They just say, oh, anybody can do that. And if you don't know what you're really good at, a good person to ask would be your mother. Or your father, if you're lucky enough that you have one of those two. Yeah? Ask your mother or your father or someone who you really love, yeah, and you all have people that you love, ask them. You say, what do you think my greatest value is? What do you think my greatest asset is? See, my mom used to tell me all the time, she used to say, Andy, your greatest asset is your ability to deal with people. And I used to say to her, Mom, everybody can deal with people. And she'd say, no, everybody can't deal with people. And it wasn't until I was about 33 years old and my company was about to go down the tubes and I realized that if I didn't restructure the entire company, that nobody else was going to do it, that I decided I was going to individually go to every single person who I owed money to and I was going to meet them and look them in the eye and shake them their hand and say, what can we do to solve this problem? And some people took stock in my company and some people gave me payment terms yeah, and the bank worked out a deal with me. Yeah, and now I know that I'm really good with people and when there's a really difficult personnel problem, I don't give it to someone else to do. I do it myself. So look at what you're really good at. Look at what, ask your friends, you know, what does this guy do like falling off a log? And maybe because you really do it so well, we tend to love the things that we do well. And instead of spending so much time and energy, I always think it's such a shame when there's somebody who's obviously a mega talent in area A and all they want to do is area B. I mean, it's okay, you know, they can learn that. But I would say to find what you love, start at least by looking at what you're really, really good at. So I promise I would only ask, answer one question. If you want to reach me, they all know how. I promised my kids I'd be home at 8.30 and it's 8.10. I still have to talk to somebody else. So thank you very much.